Well, thank you everyone for being here bright and early. Uh, how many folks attended the Inbound Marketing Summit San Francisco? Quick show of hands. Good. Good to see you here, but also nice that we've got a new audience so I don't feel like I'm saying the same thing to the same people. So folks that have already seen this, uh, please bear with us. So, as Chris so kindly mentioned, I've been doing uh, the social thing for a few years now. And just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I worked at this small financial services company in Boston called Fidelity Investments for nine years. And the only reason I mention that is that I understand how big businesses think. I understand that it's not always easy to pull off social. I talk to a lot of companies that say, look, we really want to do this, but you know, our leadership doesn't get it, or we don't know how to get started, or whatever. So I think the good thing is, is you're here, that's step one. Uh, Chris mentioned a lot of you went on Twitter, you raised your hand, that's also great. Um, but I think what you'll walk away from today and tomorrow is a better understanding of how to push the ball forward, uh, case studies that will help you go back. I'm going to give you a few statistics. It's one of the things I think you don't see enough of out there in the social space that makes it tricky. This is actually making people money, and at the end of the day, uh, the clue train thing is good, you know, the, the fact that uh, conversations are markets, markets are conversations, but your CFO doesn't care about that. And chances are your CEO probably doesn't care about that unless he's Tony Shea of Zappos. Uh, and even Tony Shea is making money. So, uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is the history of marketing, the history of companies, why we've come to this point, and then some things that you can do to help engage your constituents. Uh, a few statistics based on some case studies that I have from companies that we work with personally, but I'll mention a few anecdotally along the way because anybody that knows me and if you've ever read my blog, uh, you know that I talk not only about our companies, but I talk about everybody that's doing a good job because I'm a big believer in a rising tide raising all ships. So the title today is I'm your customer and I can't hear you. Um, I love this photo. Uh, remind me of uh, Lucille Ball back in the you know, 60s. So, this is an old-fashioned soda jerk, um, and the title is, is Once Upon a Time Businesses and Customers Talked. So that was a good thing. Businesses were small, it was before some of the technology came along that made companies scalable. The downside was is that you, know, you did have the phone that came along, you did have the web that came along, and those allowed companies now to grow beyond their local footprint. You know, you might be in Dallas, and maybe if you were lucky, you grew and you were in Fort Worth and then you went down to Houston and you went to San Antonio. Uh, but it was difficult to go across the country without a lot of effort and even then coordination was tricky. The problem was is that the phone and the internet served to disintermediate customers from businesses and vice versa. So you used to be able to walk into the hardware store and the owner of the hardware store knew who you were, knew who your family was, probably had dealt with your parents, relatives, etc. You were able to establish a relationship. If you didn't like what that store was doing or what they were selling, you could either tell them or you could vote with your feet and maybe you went to the hardware store in the neighboring town. So the problem was is that over the past 40 or 50 years, while we've gained scale through things like the phone and the web, we've lost touch with our customers, our constituents. We put them, instead of talking directly to us, we let them send emails to people that are paid $12 an hour, if that, um, sometimes working in foreign countries, and that those people's job, the customer service room, is to get people off the phone as fast as they can because they're measured on average handle time. So immediately, you're set up in a situation that uh, further distances the customer from you. And I think the problem is, if you think about it, I want to, I, I would love um, people to raise their hands if you could think of three or four companies that you love that do absolutely awesome customer service and you stay with those companies because of the fact that you love, so Tim Walker is our sole person, but he's a little different than the normal human being. Um, good one back there. So not a lot of people, okay, and that's good that you guys do, and hopefully if you're talking later, you'll tell us about those companies that do a good job. There are companies out there that do a good job. Zappos is one. We have nothing to do with Zappos other than the fact that I love Tony Shea. You like Tony Shea as well. Um, they're, they're a smart company, and they see the value of customer service. So I couldn't resist putting this picture. This is from South by Southwest. It's taken from my friend Brian Solis, uh, Francisco Dow, uh, who's now running a group called Twist Up, which is a very cool uh, event, similar you know, in coolness to my marketing summit out in the West Coast. Marketers tried to overcome this distance that got created through the phone and the web. 
shouting at their customers. Now, I mean, they didn't really shout, but they started to do things like this. Has anyone ever heard of pray and spray, or spray and pray? Yeah. Sorry, it's still early, and I'm not fully caffeinated yet. It's this idea of putting together mass messages and getting it out there to everyone. You know, it's things like Super Bowl ads. It's things like um, telemarketing. And for a while it worked, but it was this one-size-fits-all methodology, and eventually people got smarter, marketers started to segment, etc. But we've come to a point now where people are DVRing through video uh, ads, People aren't paying attention to the few dying newspapers and magazines that are left. Uh, it's harder and harder to get people's attention. So the problem is, is that marketers were yelling and the customers just started to tune them up. And I think one of the things that I got a, the I had the pleasure of seeing Chris Brogan's um, dial tone presentation, which is coming up in a little while, I think you'll really like it. It actually ties in closely with uh, why you know, people are not responding and some things that you can do that, that are really helpful in that regard. So along comes social, uh, and now we are starting to speak with one another. So who here has heard of Scott Monty from Ford? Can you raise your hands? Okay. Probably a third of you. So Scott Monty is a friend of mine, and he joined Ford, I guess, about a year ago. Uh, he is their head of social media. Who, who here has heard of Ford Motor Company? Everyone know? Okay. Ford, along with the other uh, members of the Big Three were having some problems. They've had some image problems, uh, had some financial problems, and one of the things that Ford realized in hiring Scott Monty was that having a conversation with its constituents might be a good thing. You know, they could do the, the cool truck commercials on Super Bowl, they could do cool commercials, you know, during uh, big time TV, they could put ads in newspapers and magazines. But it wasn't the same as listening to their customers and finding out what was really sort of on their customers' minds. Now, Scott, I think, on Twitter has something like 20,000 people that follow him, and he follows roughly that amount back. Now, that's not necessarily a scalable exercise, but what he is doing is one at a time, as he used to change